Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share 10 creepy Reddit horror stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash Deadenspread. The scariest haunted house in the world. First off I'm going to say something that is likely sacrilege in a place that people gather for horror stories. Halloween. That's right, you heard me. I used to be like you, I used to like it just fine. Dress up, go to a party, get tossed and scare the shit out of your friends. It's all just a good time and a night to celebrate the dark and macabre. That is until one of those nights you realize that it's not just all in good fun and your brain ends up so from the experience that you scream at the aisle full of plastic skeletons at the drugstore. For me that experience started with a flyer at my friend Jimmy found under the welcome mat of his family's house. I can still remember him running up to me with that shit eating green on his face like he'd just found the golden ticket. Kev, check this shit out. He was waving the orange piece of paper as he ran up the steps of my porch. He slapped it into my hands before I could even ask what in the hell he was so excited about. This looks like it's going to be awesome. I looked at the orange papered flyer and immediately I rolled. I was a cynical kid, I had lost my father to suicide at a young age and it left me bitter before my time. I scanned the words on the flyer already hoping I could convince Jimmy this was a stupid idea. I can still remember exactly what was written on it. Come and see. The scariest haunted house in the world. Thrill, as your heart races. Chill, feel it straight down to your bones. No two experiences will be the same, guaranteed, all ages admitted. Admission free for all brave enough to attend. 6 p.m. to 12 a.m., only open on All Hallows' Eve. Located at Patterson Farm off Briar Creek Road. These words, of course, all frame the silhouette of a spooky cartoon haunted house, typical moon in the background, typical bats flying around, and a typical black cat standing out front. I looked at Jimmy and the big dumb grin on his face and wondered how I could be friends with someone so easily entertained. You're slow right? I asked, handing him back the flyer and walking away to sit on my porch swing. Fuck you, Kevin. I think it sounds sweet. He turned the flyer over in his hands and studied it for likely the hundredth time that day. I mean it says no two experiences will be the same and it calls itself the scariest haunted house in the world. Every haunted house calls itself the scariest haunted house in the world, now nuts. I put my feet up on the porch railing and leaned back still surprised I could be friends with someone so dumb. It's a marketing thing, it's all bullshit. I mean honestly. Do you really think an all-ages admitted spook house in the middle of farm country is going to knock your socks off? You never know, it says no two experiences will be the same. Maybe they tailor it to who's walking through. The excitement in his voice was wavering as he attempted to battle against my cynicism. Give me a break. I scoffed. It's free to boot. It's probably gonna be a bunch of cheap plastic props some farmer dug out of his garage and a Sounds of the Spooky mixtape. Alyssa already said she is down to go. Finally, Jimmy had said something that piqued my interest. He'd pulled the trump card of Alyssa. She'd started at our high school a few months earlier and was easily one of the best looking girls I'd ever seen. Jimmy and she actually became somewhat friendly after he helped her get caught up in English slash lit. He never made any kind of move on her because he knew very well I was crushing hard for her. 
I sat up with a stone face and looked him dead in the eyes. Really? Her brother is having a party at nine, but she said we should head up super early, beat the crowd, then go to the party. Jimmy held the paper up next to his face and smiled. Let's have some fun, Wadia say you dick. Of course, my dumb ass said yes or I wouldn't be here telling you this story now. Alyssa had borrowed her parents' car and we rode up to Briar Creek Road. We made the turn onto the property of Patterson Farm about a quarter after six. Jimmy and Alyssa were both excited as we drove up, and I was wondering exactly how they could be so naive. We were sixteen at this point and they were both acting like they were seven. You can imagine my smug satisfaction as we pulled up to what was easily the most empty and pathetic looking haunted house I'd ever seen in my life. It basically looked as if someone had strung together a bunch of ready-to-build kit sheds into a 5x5 five five square and painted the whole mess black. There were cheap cobwebs and plastic bats hanging from the outside and a homemade sign dangling from above the door that read. Welcome to Patterson Farms. Scariest haunted house in the world. The most telling part was the lack of customers. There was no patrons lined up outside to take the trip through and it being Halloween night and this being a town without a whole lot to do it a looked as if Jimmy and Alyssa were the only two to get suckered in. Alyssa had borrowed her parents' car and we rode up to Briar Creek Road. We made the turn onto the property of Patterson Farm about a quarter after six. Jimmy and Alyssa were both excited as we drove up and I was wondering exactly how they could be so naive. We were sixteen at this point and they were both acting like they were seven. You can imagine my smug satisfaction as we pulled up to what was easily the most empty and pathetic looking haunted house I'd ever seen in my life. It basically looked as if someone had strung together a bunch of ready-to-build kit sheds into a 5x5 five five square and painted the whole mess black. There were cheap cobwebs and plastic bats hanging from the outside and a homemade sign dangling from above the door that read. Welcome to Patterson Farms. Scariest haunted house in the world. The most telling part was the lack of customers. There was no patrons lined up outside to take the trip through and it being Halloween night and this being a town without a whole lot to do it a looked as if Jimmy and Alyssa were the only two to get suckered in. Are you serious with this? I shouted out laughing and pointing in the direction of the haunted house. Look at this place. I clapped Jimmy on the shoulder. I told you, dude, I told you. Maybe all the good stuff's inside. Said Alyssa. Some of the haunted houses back in Kentucky looked like shit till you got inside of them. Her voice was uncertain, but she smiled in Jimmy's direction. Could be, Jimmy was already trying to figure out a way to justify coming to that wreck. I had known him a long time and I could see him trying to excuse his dumbass choice. Alyssa parked in the dirt lot next to the house and before I could make my case as to why we should just bail the passenger's door was thrown open by an older man dressed in a black suit and top hat. The first brave souls of the evening. Welcome, one and all. He stuck his hand in the car looking for Jimmy to give it a shake and he timidly obliged. The man grasped his hand and practically pulled him from the car smiling and patting him on the back. Come, come, and let's get this show on the road. Someone is a bit excited to see actual humans. I said under my breath in Alyssa's direction. She turned to me with wide eyes and nodded. We got out of the car and joined Jimmy by the side of the old man. I'm Phineas Patterson and welcome to the scariest haunted house in the world. 
The old man shouted as we all lined up in front of him. He gave off the vibe of a sad old grandpa that was doing his best to act excited for the kids. A carnival barker well past his prime. Come along brave souls. Mr. Patterson waved his hand for us to follow and started hobbling over towards the haunted house set up on shaky legs. Jimmy and Alyssa followed him with a shrug, I guess figuring they were gonna make the best of it and I brought up the rear with a less than enthusiastic pace. As we stepped in front of what I guess could be called the front door I saw all the cheap decorations in their full glory. Fake blood handprints lined the outside walls, strung up orange pumpkin lights, cheap cobwebs, and plastic skeletons covering the outside walls. Next to the door a boy was sitting in an old rocking chair, he looked like he couldn't have been more than eight or nine. He was wearing a devil's mask and rocking back and forth just staring at us. It was the first genuine feeling of the creeps I got that night as those yellow plastic eyes stared at me. Mr. Patterson walked over next to the boy and patted him on the head. Never mind my little devil, he's a bit shy around visitors. He flashed a yellow tooth smile. All right, who is heading in first? First. Jimmy asked, can we not all go in together? Oh, no, 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 this is a tailor-made experience. One at a time, a few minutes after the first one the next one goes. It's much scarier alone, trust me. Again, that yellow toothy smile. This time, it made me raise an eyebrow. The old man's acting had taken on a much more sinister tone. I had to give him credit he was putting his all into it. I'll go. Alyssa stepped forward. I would have expected Jimmy to volunteer first, but his eyes were locked with the kid in the devil mask, he didn't even realize a question had been asked till Alyssa answered it. Ladies first. I love it. Shouted Mr. Patterson grabbing the door handle and pulling it open. The open doorway was covered with black sheet from the inside. I must implore you young lady to keep moving, it's best not to linger too long. See you guys on the other side. Alyssa looked back at us with smile, and disappeared beyond the sheet. Mr. Patterson let the door go and it slammed shut behind her. It sent a sudden chill up my spine. Who is going to head in next? I looked at Jimmy once again expecting him to resume his childlike excitement about the whole situation. Instead, he looked at me with eyes seemed full of worry. You go first Kev. He whispered to me. Are you serious? I said. Don't tell me you're actually scared of this place. It's not that. He was quick to defend against my accusation. I just feel kind of weird all of a sudden, I'll bring up the rear. I just need a minute. Whatever. I said stepping forward. I guess it's me, old man. Mr. Patterson looked at his watch and then at the kid in the devil's mask as if looking for his approval. The devil kid looked at me and nodded signaling Mr. Patterson to grab the door handle. The old man once again flashed me a toothy grin. Are you ready son? He asked me, his voice low and sinister. As long as it's still free gramps. I squared my shoulders and stood in front of the door. Admissions free my brave soul. He chuckled to himself as he pulled the door open. The real cost is within. I laughed at his cheesy attempt to give me a chill and walked forward through the black sheet and into the room, the sound of the heavy door slamming behind me as I did. The first thing I was struck by was the sickly sweet plastic smell of the trash bags lining the walls. 
The only source of light were strings of dimly lit plastic pumpkin lights strung up just as they had been outside. Straight ahead of me I could see another door framed by plastic tombstones on either side, the sign on the door said, start here, and was drawn in red with drops to mimic splattered blood. It was all typical corny fare and very cheaply done. Any mood that had been set by the creepy devil kid and Mr. Patterson's wild-eyed acting was immediately crushed. Are you serious? I said. Don't tell me you're actually scared of this place. It's not that. He was quick to defend against my accusation. I just feel kind of weird all of a sudden, I'll bring up the rear. I just need a minute. Whatever. I said stepping forward. I guess it's me, old man. Mr. Patterson looked at his watch and then at the kid in the devil's mask as if looking for his approval. The devil kid looked at me and nodded signaling Mr. Patterson to grab the door handle. The old man once again flashed me a toothy grin. Are you ready son? He asked me, his voice low and sinister. As long as it's still free gramps. I squared my shoulders and stood in front of the door. Admissions free my brave soul. He chuckled to himself as he pulled the door open. The real cost is within. I laughed at his cheesy attempt to give me a chill and walked forward through the black sheet and into the room, the sound of the heavy door slamming behind me as I did. The first thing I was struck by was the sickly sweet plastic smell of the trash bags lining the walls. The only source of light were strings of dimly lit plastic pumpkin lights strung up just as they had been outside. Straight ahead of me I could see another door framed by plastic tombstones on either side, the sign on the door said, start here, and was drawn in red with drops to mimic splattered blood. It was all typical corny fare and very cheaply done. Any mood that had been set by the creepy devil kid and Mr. Patterson's wild-eyed acting was immediately crushed. What a waste of time. I muttered to myself as I pulled the start here door open with a creak and stepped through. The next room was draped in a thick mist from a fog machine and I could feel the chill of the air through my jacket. I could hear the ticking of a strobe light as the room quickly alternated between pitch black and fully lit almost instantly disorienting me. I heard the door slam shut behind me and turned back to see that there was no handle on my side. I heard the whirring of some kind of motor from above me and watched as another sign was slowly lowered on ropes, it was written in that same cheap blood splatter effect and said, find the way forward. I could feel the frown droop across my face as I read the words in between flashes of light. This place wasn't scary but it sure as fuck was doing its best to be annoying. I could see a hallway in front of me and started walking down it hoping I would run into Alyssa at some point, the place seemed so cheap and crappy though I was nearly sure she'd already found her way out. More cheap plastic skeletons lined the hallway and at the very end there were two hanging on opposite sides of another sign, each one was posed to pointing in different direction. The sign simply said, choose. I'm not sure what would have happened had I gone right. I like to think I would have walked out the door and into the low light of dusk, disappointment firm on my face and feeling righteous in my earlier annoyance with the evening's activity. I went left though, and what was waiting for me to the left I will never forget for as long as I live. I saw a wooden door that looked oddly familiar. I stood staring at it for a few seconds trying to shake off the sense of deja vu before reaching for the brass handle and giving it a twist. Beyond there was no plastic trash bags or skeletons, no strobe lights or rubber bats on strings. It was just a room, a little kid's room. 
Again as I stepped through the door it slammed hard behind me and just as before I turned to see there was no knob on the inside. There was another sign on the inside of the door though this one that made me feel greatly more unsettled than I was expecting that night. This sign simply said, Kevin's room, and it was framed with rocket ships blasting off toward stars. I made that sign when I was six. It was the sign that hung over my bedroom door in our old house, the house where my father had killed himself. I looked around the room and realized that it was exactly the room I had back then, even the toys scattered across the floor were my toys. I swallowed hard feeling the lump in my throat, I was overtaken by a feeling of both dread and utter confusion. Kevin. I heard a man yell from outside the door. Kevin you little snot nose. I told you to pick up your goddamn toys in the living room. It was my father's voice and as the door swung open there he was, larger than life and exactly as he was the last time I saw him. He swayed back and forth as he stepped forward into the room. The stink of booze wafted from him as he got closer and closer continuing to grumble something about those damn toys. I backed up, just like I would have when I was little and I was scared of what he might do. Look at you. He growled at me, already removing his belt. You grew up exactly like I thought you would. A skinny, weak, pathetic, little shit. He folded the belt in his hands and cracked it hard against the bedpost. My back hit the wall and I felt completely lost. It was impossible, he was dead, and he'd been dead for almost ten years. This isn't fucking real. I shouted at him. You're gone and I haven't had to deal with your bullshit in forever. You were a drunk and coward and I'm glad you're dead. Do you hear me dad, you fucking bastard, I'm glad you're dead. As the last words left my mouth I watched his face fill with sorrow. He dropped the belt on the floor and looked me in the eyes as he reached behind his back. Slowly he pulled a chrome .38 pistol out from behind his back and put it to his temple. The frown on his face curled up into a smile and suddenly he winked at me as if I was being let in on some kind of joke. The sound of the gunshot was deafening in the small room and I watched the side of his head explode outward and splatter against the wall. His body crumpled down in front of me as I stood there screaming, screaming and crying. I dropped to my knees in front of him and stared down smoke drifting out of the hole in his temple and blood pooling around his face. The door on the other side of the room creaked open and I looked up to see Alyssa standing there, a look of terror and confusion on her face. I stood up and rushed towards her, not knowing what else to do and just wanting to leave that goddamned room as fast as possible. I could hear her asking questions but my ears were still ringing from the gunshot and I doubt I was in any state to answer even if they weren't. I was only a couple steps away from her when I felt something grip my ankle and send me sprawling to the floor. I turned to look at what had caught my foot and I saw my father's corpse holding on tightly. He raised his head up to look at me with blood-filled eyes. The flesh was starting to peel away off of his face and he opened his mouth to expose a mass of maggots that had begun feeding on his tongue. I could hear Alyssa screaming and felt her hands grabbing for mine, trying to pull me away from the rotting yet now spastically lively corpse of my father. Don't let the fucking door close. I screamed to her as I kicked at the rotting body that refused to let go of me. My heel caught his jaw and it came clean off of his face, the writhing mass of maggots landing on the powder blue carpet. Jesus fuck. Please God, get me out of here. I shouted more as Alyssa pulled. You're just like me. I heard my father somehow say in a gurgling failing voice. 
You're just like me and you'll end up just like me. With my other foot, I kicked at the hand that was holding me and watched the fingers come apart like wet paper. I got free and Alyssa pulled me to my feet nearly yanking my shoulder from the socket. I could hear my father's guttural drunken laughter echo in the room even as his body fell apart as it was devoured by the maggots it seemed to be hosting. Nothing but food for the flies. Ha 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 ha. Alyssa led me out through the door as I continued screaming like a maniac. I could still hear the laughter behind me as door slammed shut. I don't know how long I lay on the floor of that hallway bawling my eyes out and paralyzed in utter fear. I felt sick and scared and Alyssa kept her arms around me, no longer bothering to ask any questions. It felt like hours that we sat just below the fog line with that strobe light bouncing off the plastic wrapped walls. When I finally got myself collected and on my feet Alyssa stayed close, her arms still wrapped around me. We need to get the fuck out of here. I said wiping the tears from my face and trying to act tough once again. There is something seriously wrong here. She shushed me and ran her fingers through my hair in a way that should have been relaxing but somehow made me feel unsettled. She was acting too calm for what we had just seen. Why are you so goddamn chill? I said pushing her away from me and looking at her. She looked stoned, a relaxed and easy smile on her face. I'm just happy I finally get to have some alone time with you. She moved closer again, her hand caressing my cheek. I've always liked you so much Kevin, but Jimmy is always hanging around. It's nice it just being us. Alyssa, why are you telling me this now? She was grinding her body up against me and I could smell her shampoo as she nuzzled her face into my neck. Her lips kissed softly as her hand suddenly slid down my body and over the crotch of my jeans. I let out a slight moan as she started to rub. Don't you want me, Kevin? I know you do. She whispered in my ear, grazing her teeth over the lobe as she finished. I could hear something rapping against the wooden door that led back to place where we had left the body of whatever was pretending to be my father. Alyssa stepped back from me again and started to take off her shirt, but I reached a hand out to stop her. Despite whatever raging teenage hormones I may have had even I knew something was completely off. We have to get the fuck out of here. What are you doing? I said sternly grabbing her by the wrist. She shook my hand away and backed off further down the hall, tears suddenly started to fill her eyes. Are you rejecting me? She shouted. How could you do this? Don't you like me? Don't you want me? Her suddenly shrill scream filled the hallway as she began peeling off her clothes frantically. I watched as she stripped down to her underwear in stunned silence. The rapping on the door next to us became more and more intense with each layer she removed. Alyssa, what the hell is wrong with you? I was in a panic, I wanted to run but didn't want to just leave her there naked in that hallway. I tried to run over to her and she pushed me away screaming, she began to claw at her skin leaving long bleeding scratch marks over her chest and stomach. Don't you think I'm fucking beautiful, Kevin? She was tearing chunks of her own flesh off now and discarding them on the ground with her clothes. Isn't this what you want from me? I watched in abject horror as she finally peeled away the skin from her torso exposing the bleeding muscle beneath. Fat and sinew fell off of her shredded body as she removed more and more of her skin. The rapping against the door grew louder and louder sounding more like someone slamming all their weight against the door as she screamed and cackled like a maniac. 
Fear overtook me and turned to run down the other hallway, towards what I hoped would be the exit. I felt her slimy blood-drenched hand reach out and grab my arm tightly before she slammed me up against the wall with more strength than I could have imagined. I wheezed as all the air left my lungs and I felt her body, now naked of most of its skin, press against me. She once again nuzzled her face up to my neck and I gagged feeling her shredded flesh press to my body. Don't you want to fuck me, Kevin? She whispered before finally leaning back far enough that I could see her face. The skin began to slough off her face leaving bulging eyeballs in an exposed bloodstained skull. Her lipless mouth opened and she leaned in to kiss me with a protruding tongue. I pulled all my strength and finally shoved her away from me leaving her staggered enough that I could break into a sprint. I could hear her wailing and cackling behind me as I ran through the disorienting fog and strobing lights, looking for some way out of that fucking maze. I saw more signs but ignored any that didn't say exit, I didn't want any more, the spook house won and I was fucking terrified beyond anything I had ever felt. It seemed never ending and grew more and more disturbing as I ran. The plastic skeletons hanging from the walls were now limbless corpses with dangling entrails and the trash liners on the walls felt slick with slime and blood every time I ran into one. My heart was racing and with each corner I turned only to find another hallway I became convinced I was going to die in there. The voices of both Alyssa and my father followed me as I frantically searched for some way out. Don't you want me? Just like me. Kevin, this is meant to be. Food for the flies. I clapped my hands over my ears trying my best to block them out as I filled the air with the sound of my own screams. I thought I was going to lose my mind and nearly lost all hope when I suddenly I came to a hallway that was a dead end. There was one last sign above the door. It was written in that same cheesy spooky writing, blood drips and all and appeared black in the strobing lights. I laughed manically and ran up to the door pulling on it in the vain hopes that it would just fly open and I would be greeted by the chill air of the October evening. It didn't move though, no matter how much I wrenched on the door handle it wouldn't budge and I could hear the voices getting closer behind me. You get under my skin. Kevin. You're going to rot with the maggots, son. They sounded like they were right behind me, but I couldn't bring myself to look. I just kept pulling on the door handle and screaming out to for someone to save me. I could feel every nightmare I ever had breathing down my neck, laughing, screaming, and preparing itself to pull me apart body and soul. I heard one final voice the voice of a young child. Turn around, was all it said. Slowly I turned my head to look and saw the boy in the devil mask standing a few feet from me. Behind the rubber demon's face I knew he was smiling. What the fuck do you want from me? I shouted, my voice lacking any hope. The boy just stood staring with dead yellow eyes as the entire world fell silent. Boo! He suddenly shouted lunging forward and startling me into the door. I felt the hinges swing open as my back hit the wood and I went tumbling out into the crisp autumn air. As I fell backward onto my ass into the dirt I heard the door slam shut as the faint giggling of a child's laughter could be heard behind it. I sat there stunned, unable to process that I was free even as I stared at the outside of the spook house. The fake plastic skeletons and pumpkin lights still strung up around the outside. Kevin. I heard Jimmy shout from what seemed like miles away. I only realized he was right next to me when he grabbed me under my shoulder to try and lift me to my feet. Dude, are you okay? 
I stared at him with a blank expression on my face trying to find words to explain what had just happened to me. Behind him, I could see Alyssa, her head hanging down and her face solemn and broken and I knew what I'd seen inside the haunted house hadn't been her at all. I, we need to go. I whispered. I could hear Mr. Patterson standing by the door laughing a sly little laugh. We need to go now. Was it that bad? What happened in there? I was feeling sick and I never actually went in. It couldn't be that bad. Jimmy's voice was making my head hurt and I wanted to leave, I just wanted to get as far away from that place as possible. It was bullshit. I heard Alyssa say, her eyes locking to mine as I looked up at her. It was just a bullshit haunted house that wasted all of our time. Kevin's right, we need to go now. She started walking towards the car and I followed, fine with not saying another thing about what I saw inside and having no desire to ask what she had seen either. Jimmy followed us, he kept asking questions the confusion clear as day on his face but I could do nothing but tune him out. As we got in the car and drove away I saw Mr. Patterson standing by the door waving us goodbye, the little boy in the devil mask standing at his side. When we got back to school Jimmy told people we had gone but no one else had gotten a flyer and no one knew that there was ever a haunted house up at the Patterson farm. People asked Alyssa and I both what had happened but we never said a word and when people got bored of asking I thanked God. One of the last times someone tried to ask me about it in class I ended up shouting at them to stop asking me about Patterson Farm. A teacher overheard the exchange and asked what it was all about, I tried to tell her it was nothing, just something that happened up at a spook house at Patterson Farm on Halloween. I can still remember the confused look on her face as she told me that there was no haunted house at Patterson Farm. In fact that she said the place had been abandoned for over a year. Ever since Phineas Patterson had died. Second story. This story was shared. By you slash Rickendickendack 123. I'm an author and everything I write comes true. I've been writing for as long as I could remember. Ever since I was a kid, it was my way of escaping the boring reality and immersing myself in the fictional world, which I could create by putting words on paper. From such an early age, I knew that writing was exactly what I wanted to do in life, regardless of whether I'd be doing it for free or for money. Luckily though, through perseverance and hard work, I managed to make it a full-time job for myself and sold thousands of copies thus far. But self-promotion is not the reason why I'm here. I'm here to tell you about a series of events that happened to me lately, which I can't quite explain. Recently, strange occurrences have been happening in my life and more and more I'm starting to get convinced that it is more than a coincidence or an unsavory prank. Let me take it from the top. A week ago, I returned home and found one of my books open on my kitchen table. It was my first published book called The Struggles of the Heart. The book was a fictional story, but utilized real characters, including myself as the protagonist and the people that I knew. When I glanced at the book, I realized it was open on page 124 and a certain paragraph was highlighted. The paragraph read as. He opened the envelope and his heart started racing. He reread the lines over and over, darting over them speedily, but no matter how many times he read them, the sentences remained the same. He dropped the envelope and rubbed his eyes, sighing in despair. Although he saw it coming miles away, he didn't know how he would pick himself up from getting evicted from his apartment. He figured he could stay with his sister for a while, despite their relationship not being so good over the last few years. 
The first thing that struck me as odd was the fact that I didn't remember leaving the book open on this particular page, or even taking it off the shelf, for that matter. I live alone, so no one else could have done it, but I figured that I must have done it unconsciously earlier when I was in a hurry to the dentist and couldn't find my keys. That still didn't explain why the paragraph was highlighted, but the book has been sitting here for years, so maybe my ex-wife fiddled with it while we still live together. Two days later, I received a letter in my mailbox. On top of the letter, with big, bold letters I saw the title eviction notice. I rapidly skimmed through the letter and deduced that the reason for my eviction was not paying rent. This was a mistake though, because I always paid my rent on time, so I decided to go back to my apartment and make a call to fix this right away. The lady who answered the phone, although very polite and patient, was able to confirm to me that the rent had indeed not been paid and not just that, but apparently, I was late with rent a few consecutive months prior to that and the only reason why I was not evicted was the landlord's goodwill. I explained that this must have been some kind of mistake, but the lady confirmed once more that there's no mistake and that I have three days to move out. Communication with the landlord was impossible as well, since he hired an agency to do everything for him, as he lived outside the country. After hours of pursuing and trying to fix the problem, I realized that there was no point in fighting and that I would have to look for another apartment. It wasn't until I started packing and picked up the book again that I remembered seeing the highlighted paragraph from a few days ago. I started thinking that someone was setting me up, or trying to prank me, but I had no idea who would do it. None of my friends had such bad taste in jokes and besides, it didn't explain how they would be able to get inside my apartment and do such an elaborate thing, all so they could get a kick out of my predicament. Nevertheless, I decided to continue packing and hope that someone would jump in front of me when I stepped out of the apartment and shout, Got you. Two days had gone by and I had already arranged to move in with my sister until I find a new apartment. She was completely okay with me being there as long as I needed and I thanked her for that. I was about to get out of my apartment with my bags packed when I saw a slip of paper under my door. I picked it up and realized that I was staring at a page from my book. It said. The news devastated him. His older brother was also like a father to him throughout his entire life and hearing about his car crash was like getting stabbed in the heart and the knife being twisted. The doctor said that he died instantly, crushed by the truck, so there was virtually no chance of resuscitating him. What would happen to his children now? Their mother left years ago when they were still young and there was no trace of her anywhere. He'd gladly take the responsibility of raising them, since he saw them as his own children in many ways, but he was barely able to support himself financially, let alone two extra children. My phone started to ring. I answered it without even looking at the caller. Hello, I said. I heard my sister's voice on the other end. She was crying and gasping for air. Kelly. Kelly, are you okay? I asked. She whimpered for a moment, before saying. It's Michael. He's, she burst into tears again. I felt my stomach dropping to the floor and my heart beginning to race, already anticipating the worst news. What about Michael? Kelly, what about him? I pressed her, but it was no use, as she couldn't form words between her sobs. H. He's, he had a car ACC accident. He's gone, she burst into even more violent sobs but before I could continue asking more questions, my phone slipped out of my hand and dropped on the floor. I felt as if I had been hit by a truck myself. 
I started hyperventilating and my vision got blurry from the tears forming in my eyes. I tried pushing the feeling away, but the harder I tried, the more it seemed to intensify. I dropped on the floor, crying for hours. My older brother was dead. Asterisk. Two days later, I was at my sister's place. I had settled in already and we had started planning Michael's funeral. Although the circumstances of Michael's death were indeed bizarre, I was mourning and didn't even think about the possibility of someone being out to get me to such lengths that they would murder my brother. At the time, all of it being a crazy coincidence is the only explanation I had. Kelly had already flown out of state to Michael's town and I planned to join her as soon as I wrapped up my own work. It was around midnight and I was doing some writing to take my mind off things, when I got thirsty and decided to go down to the kitchen for some milk. I drank directly from the carton and it wasn't until I closed the fridge that something caught my attention. There, in the middle of the fridge, among Kelly's kids' drawings, stuck by a smiley face magnet was another page from my book. With trembling hands, I picked it up, dreading what I'd read next. I had to hold the paper with both hands to be able to read it properly, as my hands were trembling so badly. It said. There was a knock on the door. Peering through the peephole, he saw his ex-wife's angry face staring blankly at him. He opened the door and braced himself for the flurry of swear words and accusations that she would force him to endure. She was right to do so, but despite that, he wasn't ready for this just yet. Just then, there was a knock on the front door. I stared in the direction of the foyer, my heart just about ready to leap out of my chest. It was so deafeningly quiet, that I heard my own quivering breath, until the loud knocking resounded in the house once more, almost making me jump out of my skin. The knocking sounded impatient and angry and I knew that whoever was there at this time of the night had no intention of having a friendly chat. I slowly approached the front door, trying to be as quiet as possible, while the knocking persisted, louder and more frantic this time. Carefully, I peered through the peephole and sure enough, my ex-wife's face stared back at me. If the events in reality followed the events in the book, then this encounter would be mostly innocuous, stressful at most, I thought. There is just one problem, though. My ex-wife died for three years ago. Third story. This story was shared by you slash 1000 Endonanites. The ghosts that haunted my old building. I saw the ghosts haunting my new place the very first night. By then it was too late of course. I had been through hell trying to find a place, I had already signed the lease, and this was the perfect spot, close to the hospital where I worked, affordable yet nice and newly renovated. Anyway, I soon realized the ghosts wouldn't harm me, Indeed they seemed to have no interest in me, nor I in them. I worked hard, long shifts and I was usually dead on my feet by the time I got home, barely staying awake long enough to shovel some food down my throat before falling asleep on the couch, dragging myself bleary-eyed to bed a couple of hours later. A few shadows flitting here and there, a few whispers and groans were hardly going to bother me, I saw much worse at work. I guess it was weird that they all had broken necks. Every single one of them. The young boy who couldn't have been more than fourteen. The pregnant girl. The good-looking tall man who looked like a young Paul Newman. Even with a broken neck, his head lying sideways on his shoulders, the charm of his bright blue eyes and his dashing smile shone. I wondered how many women had fallen at his feet when he flashed that smile at them when he was still alive. There were many more. 
They flitted around the corners of my apartment, I caught sight of them hanging around the elevators and stairwells, muttering and sighing. They vanished behind the shower curtain just as I would enter the bathroom and disappeared into the closet as I fell into bed. My first day off since I moved there was a brilliant sunny day, one of those perfect early fall days that are so much more beautiful than anything spring or summer can ever offer. I felt the fatigue of the week seeping out of my bones as I lounged in the kitchen, holding my coffee. Even the sight of the boy scurrying out of the window, his head perched awkwardly on his shoulder didn't dampen my spurts. It did however pique my curiosity. Seriously, what was with the broken necks? I moved to the window and looked out into the morning sun. In the sunlight, I could clearly see a cluster of them on the fire escape landing. The fire escape stairs weave its way down the back of the building, narrow black metal steps with a small landing on each floor. There must have been four of them huddled closely on the landing beneath mine. And then I noticed, they were not alone. My neighbor in the unit below me, a young woman with shining brown and yellow hair was seated with them. The only one of the group who was alive, her neck straight and unbroken, wearing fresh modern clothes. I had already realized the ghosts were all mostly dressed in grimy tatters, except of course for Paul Newman, who was sharply dressed in black. I had seen her few times already, enough to say, hi, and do that half-hearted smile and nod thing. She seemed like a smart, well-put-together young woman, with a nice long career ahead of her. But I guess there was no reason for her not to see the ghosts, much like I did. And more than that. It was evident by the relaxed way she was sitting with me on the landing, her legs dangling off the side, that she had already developed a relationship with them. The sight of her chatting away with the ghosts made me uneasy, in a way that just sighting the ghosts, their whispers and their sighs around the building never did. What on earth were they talking about in such an animated fashion? Innocently, I opened my own kitchen door and stepped out onto my landing. I could hear their voices, though low, quite clearly, even through the shouts of the children playing on the grassy area outside. We won Charlie's case. I heard my living neighbor say. Honestly, it's a personal victory for me, I hope you appreciate that. His family are going to be comfortable now. E e e e that's nice Katie, said the pregnant girl. Good for you. I was wondering where he'd got to, I missed seeing him all mopey and mangled up on the grounds, with his bloody yellow vest. He found peace then. Good job Katie. I saw Katie smiling. Yup, it was hard, and the company put up a brutal fight. But I did it. Good for him then. And you. But what does that get us, eh? We're just still left here, aren't we, like always, cried the young boy, his eyes staring upwards at Katie. I looked at Katie's earnest young face through the metal railings, full of pity and heartache for these wretched ghosts and I knew she wanted to help them find peace, too. I kept listening, and learning. The building was on the side of the old courthouse, and the stairwell was exactly where the city gallows stood. It was Judge Wilson, Mary said. She was the pregnant girl. Mary had been hung for murdering her master who had slept with her. Her youthful beauty shone through despite her broken neck. They had said she had tricked the jail warden into impregnating her to escape hanging, even though she was already pregnant when arrested. They said her bastard should die with her. Her master and his wife had made sure of it, not wanting any rivals for their own children around. She told the story as she must have done so many times before, the pain, anger, 
and bewilderment in her voice still fresh, untarnished by the passage of time. I know the Wilson family, said Katie, her voice clear through the shuffling mumbling ghost voices. They own the development company which built this place, the company we sued for Charlie. Still city bigwigs. E was a cruel wicked man. It's not right, is family prancing a boot town while we're all stuck air, can't move on because of his wickedness. This was Johnny, who would have turned 14 the day after he was hung for being part of a notorious crime gang. The leader of the gang had struck a deal with the court and given up Johnny as part of the deal. The gang leader's descendants today were partners in the Wilson Development Company. Katie sighed. It wasn't just Judge Wilson, it was all corrupt. They clustered around her, their sideways faces pleading. Please Katie. Free us too. The Paul Newman smile flashed crookedly, you'll do it for me Katie, right? My blood ran cold. Others might die. There are children here. Katie protested. Mary cradled her belly. And my child isn't dead. There has to be blood. I knew Katie would do what it was they were asking her to do. Even though I don't remember making any movement or noise, I must have done, because suddenly all of them, Katie included, turned up, looking straight at me. Those terrible sideways faces and eyes the wrong way around, staring at me through the railing still haunt my nightmares. E's been listening to us, cried out Mary. Maybe E's with the Wilsons. A spy, said Johnny. I turned and without saying a word, I went inside. But I couldn't stay. The walls of the apartment were bearing down on me, the whispers and sighs, so harmless before, were piercing my brain. I threw on a jacket and went outside to clear my head. I walked quickly through the children's ball game on the grassy, reaching a secluded wooded area further out. I felt better, my heart rate slowing as I wandered among the trees, breathing deeply. And then I heard a footstep, a breaking twig. I turned around but it was too late. The last thing I saw was Katie, bearing down on me with a bat. A flash went off in my head and I tumbled down into darkness. I swam back to consciousness. My head was throbbing and white lights were drilling into me. A voice said, there he is. You may not think it now, but you were one of the lucky ones. Being in the hospital saved you. I concentrated. It was my colleague speaking, looking kindly down at me. What happened? I croaked. She gave me some water. They found you unconscious in the woods, with head trauma. They picked up the person who will be charged with starting the fire, the police were over here, they think it's the same person who attacked you. I blinked. What fire? Oh honey, of course, you wouldn't know. Sorry I've been rushed off my feet. Burn victims in the corridors. I have to run. But your building, yes. It's gone. One of your neighbors went apes hit and burned it down last night. She left. I watched Katie's trial. She calmly described how easy it had been to set the building on fire. The Wilson contractors had cheated on the insulating materials, and within ten minutes, the whole edifice was aflame. She showed no remorse. Twenty-five people died, several by throwing themselves and their children out off the windows on the higher floors. Not as many as had hung wrongfully, but enough to free their ghosts. For when I was able, I walked around the burnt ruins of the building. 
It was peaceful, with no signs of the ghosts. Fourth story. This story was shared by you slash old rocking chair. Can a new house be haunted? Hi. I'm relatively new to the no sleep community, and it seems that some of you can provide insights on what we've been experiencing in our house. Now, to start off, the house I've been living in is not old. My family and I have been living in it for about 15 years now, but it's built from ground up. The land was a gift from my grandfather to my mother and her sister. They built their house on this plot of land, like I said, only 15 years ago. But the house is a bit spooky. Mostly it lies quiet, but sometimes it takes you by surprise. Well, my family and I are not surprised anymore, because we're used to it. What I'm curious about now is if you guys think the ghosts of this house is good or not. Since we were kids, this house has been a place for unexplained events. The earliest spooky thing that I can remember is when my sisters and I would play upstairs with the door closed someone would knock, then we'd open it to find no one there. No, I don't remember how many knocks it was, but it happened often enough that we learned to expect that there was no one knocking about half the time. Second incident is when we were all upstairs at night, we'd hear things moving around in our dining room. We have these wooden chairs, not too heavy, but enough so that the wind can't move them. We'd hear plates clanking around but of course, there would be no one there. Anyone who would go down and check would find things unmoved. Again, this happens often enough so we weren't scared anymore. There are lots of others I might post it if I think there's a need, but here's the last two incidents that had me thinking about our house guest. A couple of months ago, I had to wake up really early for a trip 4 a.m. Now my bedroom door faces the staircase, and when I sleepily got up to turn my alarm off, I happened to glance downstairs. There was a silhouette going downstairs. I didn't think too much of it, I was still groggy, but when I went downstairs, no one was there. Doors locked. Everyone else asleep in their bed. So what did I do? I lay down on the couch downstairs to sleep some more. It was only later that it sunk in and begun to scare me. And just a few minutes ago, my sister called to me upstairs to ask what fell down. I was on my computer and listening to music, and I replied that I didn't hear anything. She told me that she heard a loud sound that seemed like something big falling down. I told her I was listening to music. She accepted that excuse for not hearing anything, but I checked everything upstairs just in case. Nothing fell down. I'm a bit spooked. I don't know anything about the land our house is standing on, but this thing's falling down phenomena is new. The others aren't. Some neighbors, and some visitors, say that our house is creepy, but I'm not sure what they're basing it on. Should we worry? Fifth story. This story was shared by you slash Chike de Luna. My cellmate was possessed. I was two years into a three-year jail sentence for robbery when I was transferred to 12 Caesars Correctional Facility in New Mexico. I remember the cellmate I wound up with, this guy called Hector Ochoa. He was an average-looking Joe, part Mexican, part I don't know what, very low-key, used to spend most of his time reading his Bible, or writing in this alligator hide notebook he kept tucked into his waistband. I've had a fair few cellmates in my time, but this Hector guy was seriously offbeat. He wasn't violent or anything. He wasn't dangerous in the conventional sense of the word, but he gave off this really creepy vibe. The other inmates steered well clear of him. 
Not even the gangbangers messed with this hombre. The first few days sharing a cell with him I was tearing my hair out. I kept thinking there were huge bugs crawling all over my flesh. I couldn't stop scratching. Turns out the bugs were all in my head. Hector slept on the bottom bunk. Every night after lights out he'd lie there praying in Spanish. He'd pray in this never-ending drone. It drove me crazy. Made it next to impossible to sleep. A couple of nights in, I wake up suddenly. It's maybe two or three in the morning and for a moment I'm disorientated. I don't have a clue where I am. I hear this woman whispering in the bunk below me. I can't hear what she's saying but I know it's a woman, it sounds like Hector and this woman are whispering to each other. That's when I sit bolt upright. Instantly the voices stop and when I peer into the bottom bunk I see Hector fast asleep. I would have chalked the whole thing up to my imagination, but that wasn't the end of it. Not by a long shot. Next day I met up with a friend of mine, Dave, in the prison refectory. What the fuck is it with this guy? I asked. Dave gave me this look so I lowered my voice and said, you know my new Sally. Hector. He nodded. What about him? Dude creeps me out, man. Yeah, well, you seriously need to watch your back with that guy, Dave tapped his forehead with his finger, he ain't right, man. What do you mean, ain't right? You seen his tattoo? The one on his back. I shook my head. He keeps his shirt on. Ask him to show it to you. Why, you know something about it. I know what it represents. Hector rarely spoke to me. He was the quietest cellmate I'd ever had. Most cellmates you couldn't get to shut up, but Hector was different. He sat there on his bed and he might as well have been in solitary for all the fucks he gave. I figured I couldn't just come out and ask to see his tattoo, so I broke the ice by showing him a few of mine. I had an image of the Virgin Mary on my left bicep. A rose on my right calf. Bayonets crisscrossed against my belly. Do you have any tats? I asked. He nodded. I waited, but when it became obvious he wasn't going to say anything else, I pressed him, can I see? He frowned. Why? I shrugged. Just curious. He stared at me for a while and then he set his Bible aside and shrugged his shirt off as he stood up. He turned around so I could see his back. As I stared at his tattoo I felt slow fingers of WTF creeping up my spine. The tattoo took up the entire surface area of his back. It displayed a woman. She was tall and painfully emaciated, with bloodshot eyes that bulged horribly out of their sockets. Her flesh was corpse pale and she wore a grin that split her face from ear to ear. That grin was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen. She looked demonic, I could literally feel her eyes boring into mine. Jesus! I muttered. Sonriendo Boca. Hector said as he put his shirt back on. What? He turned to face me, lady grinning mouth, he said, you heard of her. I shook my head. You wear her image, he said, and no one's going to fuck with you, S.A., me and teens. According to Hector, there were shaman in the rural areas of Mexico, Bruja who could invoke spirits through something he called black tattoos, but you had to shed innocent blood before you got one of those tattoos, you had to cut the throat of a virgin, drain her blood into a copper vessel, the blood would be mixed with ink, the ink would be mixed with the semen of a black goat. 
Only then could the tattoo be drawn. If you survived the ensuing infection, you became a doorway. Your guardian angel lived on the other side of that door. Lady Grinning Mouth was Hector's guardian angel. Now, there were a lot of dangerous men in our jail, but one of them in particular, Diego Gomez aka The Machine, now he was the guy that bothered me the most, because no one else would fuck with me on account of Hector being my celly, but Diego, he wasn't afraid of Hector, in fact quite the opposite, he made it pretty clear that he wanted Hector's hide hanging on his cell wall. The fight between Hector and Diego Gomez went down like this. Diego was serving life for double homicide. No chance of parole. Nothing to lose but his life, and that life was a living hell. The only thing that meant shit to him was his rep. He heard about Hector soon after he was transferred to our jail. He knew the other prisoners respected Hector, were afraid of Hector. He wanted that respect. He wanted that fear. He was a monster of a man. Six foot four, two hundred and twenty pounds of solid muscle, and so many fucking tattoos he looked like the illustrated guide to end times. I passed him a couple of times in the exercise yard and I can honestly say Diego Gomez was one heathen son of a bitch you didn't want to mess with. But when I told him Diego was gunning for him, Hector didn't even glance up from his Bible. He don't have no guardian angel, he said contemptuously. A couple of days later Diego launched an unprovoked attack on Hector in the prison gym, almost cracked his skull clean open with a dumbbell, but the guards broke it up in time and Hector spent the next two days in the infirmary, high on morphine whilst they put 21 stitches in his head. They would have stuck Diego in solitary but Hector wouldn't snitch on him and the guards weren't too clear on who started the fight, so in the end Diego got off scot-free. When he came back to our cell, his head all bandaged up, Hector had this darkness in his eyes, like he could skin a rattlesnake with his raw teeth. I didn't say anything to him. In jail you quickly learn when a man wants to be left alone. But that look in his eyes. Right at that moment I wouldn't have traded places with Diego Gomez for all the whores in Detroit. That night Hector is lying on his bunk chanting all this weird shit in this language I'd never heard before. I don't speak Spanish but I know what Spanish sounds like and this wasn't Spanish. This was some tribal sounding shit. It creeped me out. The cell was cold. Things didn't feel right. I felt those bugs crawling over my flesh again and I couldn't stop scratching. Fucking things were driving me insane. After a long while that sensation of insects started to fade until it got to a point it wasn't a bother no more. I was drifting in and out of sleep after that, and it was about an hour later when all of a sudden Hector stops praying. After the continuous murmur of his voice, the silence pressing down on my ears was almost ominous. I lay there on the top bunk, staring at a spot on the ceiling, and slowly the ambient sounds of the prison began to reinsert themselves, the coughing, the snoring, the distant clangs, the echo of faraway voices, and then suddenly I felt the bunk shift slightly and I sensed someone standing up from the bottom bunk. I figured Hector was getting up to use the toilet so I kept on lying there, eyes half closed, and I could just make out Hector's shadow to the left of me. He was just standing there. Not moving. That seemed a bit strange so I opened my eyes and turned my head to ask him what was wrong. I swear to Christ I still have nightmares about what I saw standing there. It wasn't Hector. It was the woman from Hector's fucking tattoo. Only she wasn't a tattoo no more. She was standing about a foot from me and she was staring down at me with those bulging bloodshot eyes, 
and she had this grin that split her face in half. Oh, Christ, that fucking grin. I can't wipe the memory of it, doesn't matter how many bottles of wild Irish rose I drink, doesn't matter how many shots of tequila I knock back, I can't stop seeing that grin. It was the most horrific thing you could imagine. She had black lips and long yellow teeth, and her mouth was stretched so wide apart there was no way her jaw hadn't dislocated. I couldn't move. I just wanted to leap up off that bunk, I just wanted to scream in fucking horror, but I couldn't move, it was a wide awake nightmare, and that demon's face no more than a foot from mine. Pale corpse skin and long black hair plastered to her skull and that grin, neon bright and five miles wide, and my mind was caving in on itself, I was going insane staring at that thing. And then, to my enormous relief, she turned away from me and slipped out through the bars of our cell. A moment later I sat bolt upright on my bunk and dragged in a wheezing breath. Jesus, what the hell? I jumped out of bed and instantly I saw Hector lying on his belly on his bunk. His eyes were rolled all the way up in his skull so I could only see the whites. His prison shirt had been dragged all the way up, exposing his bare back. I crouched down beside him. The tattoo on his back was missing. The breath left me a low involuntary whistle. His back was bare. It was like that thing had climbed right up out of his skin. I kept telling myself that was knee-deep crazy, but in my gut, in my balls, I knew that's exactly what had happened. I crouched, quivering, in a corner of the cell and waited until that monster came back. I knew sooner or later she would return. And I was petrified. I hadn't felt this scared since I was a little boy. That grin. Those eyes. Jesus Christ, I was literally pissing myself in terror. I kept whispering to myself, please don't notice me, don't notice me, don't notice me, please, Jesus please, don't look in my direction. All that while Hector lay on his belly, his eyes rolled up to whites, and every now and then he'd undergo this violent series of convulsions, or else he'd start whispering in Spanish, but for the most part he'd lie there, still as a corpse. I kept my attention fixed on the bars of the cell, the small square of passage visible beyond. My heart was pounding against the walls of my chest. My lips were moving silently and I realized I was praying. I hadn't prayed in fifteen years. After about ten minutes or so I felt the air grow chill and tense and the hairs started crawling on my scalp. She was coming back. I knew she was coming back. I made this involuntary mewling sound and tried to push myself further back into the shadows but the wall of the cell was pressed right up against my back. I'd reached my limit. I was trapped in my own nightmare. The lights in the passage started flickering violently, like Morse code, and then suddenly, without warning, she was there, peering at me through the bars of the cell. I could see that grin like a ghastly wound splitting her face. Eyes burning into my soul. Voice whispering in my brain, telling me, it's a joke, it's all a joke, everything's a joke, over and over, and after a while I realize I'm grinning, wide as a lunatic, and weeping blood, I can't stop the tears from flowing, because everything's a joke. God help me, my whole life has been a joke. The monster slips back through the bars of the cell and glides across to the bunk. She pauses for a second, staring down at Hector. I'm slamming the heel of my hands against my head, trying to get rid of the voices, I'm hooking my fingers into my mouth, digging into my jaw bones, trying to erase that grin, can't stop fucking grinning, can't stop weeping, blood, Blood, Jesus, 
I'm bleeding from the eyes, hemorrhaging regrets, dear fuck, I'm sorry, sorry, hello. Anyone out there? Anyone reading? Everything is real, nothing, 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 don't you see, the joke, I'm dreaming me dreaming you dreaming me. And then the monster lays down on top of Hector and there's a moment of intense visual distortion, like a movie with several frames missing, and then she's gone. I continue to sit there, staring at Hector, and slowly but surely, I feel the pressure easing in my jaws, the grin slowly relaxing, fading, and then I'm dragging in huge gulps of air as I scramble to my feet. I peer down at Hector. The tattoo has appeared on his back again. The demon glares up at me from his flesh, grinning wide as the moon, and quickly I reach out and drag Hector's shirt down across it. Covering it. Erasing it. It's all a joke. Everything. Rumors are like contagion in a prison, neither walls nor bars can stop them. I can't sleep the rest of that night. No one can. Five minutes after the demon returned, Diego Gomez started laughing. He was six cells up from me and at first he started chuckling, real low, like the way somebody laughed when they'd remembered something funny, that kind of chuckle, and then, after a while, he was laughing out loud, and convicts calling out and advising him he better shut the fuck up, and other convicts laughing as well, like they kind of got the joke but no one got the joke like Diego got the joke. By this time he was literally shrieking with laughter, I've never heard anything so unnerving, he wasn't laughing the way a sane person laughs, you could actually hear the desperation in his voice, like laughing was the only way he could scream, I don't know if that makes sense, I don't know what the hell makes sense anymore. Everyone was awake. You could see them standing in their cells, peering silently out through the bars, but no one was yelling out for Diego to quit laughing anymore. You only had to hear Diego's laugh to know something wasn't right. After a while the lights went on and the guards came to see what was wrong. They passed my cell on the way to Diego's. I was standing close to the bars. Hector was standing with me by this time. We watched the guards rush past, yelling and cursing, and then, when they got to Diego's cell, they stopped yelling and they stopped cursing and I heard one of them say. And that's when everything went nuts. The guards rushing about like lunatics, calling for paramedics, calling for restraints, everyone screaming at once, and through it all Diego never once stopped laughing. I turned to Hector. Hector was nodding as he listened to Diego laugh. He was nodding like he got the joke. He don't have no guardian angel, he said softly. Diego Gomez, aka The Machine, strangled his cellmate, a guy called Chad Beacon, to death with his bare hands. Rumor told me Diego Gomez exerted so much pressure that Chad's eyes hemorrhaged and his skin literally turned black. He was laughing whilst he strangled Chad. After killing his cellmate, Diego reached up and tore his own eyes out of his skull. He kept on laughing all the time. No one knows why he did it but some inmates in close-by cells swear to Christ they saw a woman in Diego's cell shortly before things went crazy. She was whispering to him. She must have been telling him something pretty funny because Diego was grinning from ear to ear. Sixth story. This story was shared by you slash Robert Downey Cohen. I think my sister was possessed. So this all took place around 10 years ago in a house I no longer live in. Ever since I was born, I've always been involved with the supernatural whether it was directed towards me or happening around me. The first house I lived in in Long Island, New York was haunted by a man and his dog. 
Nothing frightening ever happened to us in that house, only the occasional sighting of the man in the corner of our eyes walking down the hallway, or the sound of his dog's collar jingling as it explored the place it once called home. We eventually moved out of the house and went south to a decent-sized home in North Carolina. This is where things escalated. The first sighting in that house was of my own dad. He had passed away from some strange type of cancer he had caught from being at ground zero on September 11th. I remember waking up that morning to my mother crying outside of her room. I was still young and didn't quite grasp what had happened to my father. I remember running up the stairs after hearing of my father's death and waking up my brother to tell him, like it was some kind of crazy news that I couldn't wait to see his reaction of. I don't even think I cried that day. It wasn't until a few years after where I truly felt the weight of his passing. I was walking to school and as I looked back at my mother who waved from the window, I caught a glance of what looked like a man standing right beside her. I don't know why I got on the bus and waited until I got to school but when I did, I had frantically asked my teacher to use the phone and immediately called home. To my relief, my mother picked up and sounded completely fine. I can't remember when my sister became interested in the paranormal but I do remember what had resulted in her curiosity. My sister and her friends would play with Ouija boards and do other spiritual communication crap behind my mother's back and would eventually bring something home that was pure evil. She was the one who had mostly experienced the brunt of it, though I had my fair share of moments with her new friends. I remember one day after taking a shower, I was looking in the mirror and caught something in the reflection and when my eyes drifted to the shower curtain, still looking in the mirror, I could see the face of what I had thought was a witch at the time. It looked like whatever it was was behind the shower curtain, pressing its face against it. It seemed perfectly molded into the curtain and I'll never forget the look on its face. It had a grin stretched across its face like it had been laughing at me. My sister, of course, had it worse. She would tell me of the shadow people who would walk back and forth between our rooms, peeking their heads in but never able to enter. I think it was partly because of the crosses we had mounted near our doors but who knows. The shadow people would eventually stop but other things pursued my sister. One day I had been downstairs doing God knows, and suddenly I hear my sister scream. I ran up the stairs to find my sister shaking on the floor in her room, looking at a calendar laying across the floor far from the wall it had previously been hanging from. She told me that a voice announced itself to her as the devil before launching her calendar off of the wall. Now, this is where I was led to believe something had taken over my sister. I was laying in my bed one night and my door was slowly pushed open and in came my sister holding a lit candle. There was a blank expression on her face, and when I asked her what she was doing, she only stared at me in silence for a moment longer before she closed my door and switched off my lights. She then proceeded towards my bed and climbed up, laying beside me, she still had an emotionless expression on her face. She then spoke, telling me to close my eyes and not open them no matter what I hear. I'll be honest, I don't remember much of what happened after that, and it could be that nothing happened at all, but I can't shake a strange feeling from deep inside whenever I think of that night. All I know is that my sister left a strange impression on me that I'll never let go of. Now I know that most of this stuff is coming from my sister and she could very well be lying about it, though what makes me believe her is how skeptical of a person she has grown into. She's not one to believe in a higher power and still quote science for most explanations, though, to this day, she can't explain the sequence of events that happened to her all those years ago. 
I believe that she has resentment towards God for taking our father away. I completely understand how she feels. I wouldn't call myself a religious person but I often try talking to God for answers. My father was a good man and an even better father. Why was a man like him taken away so soon? I often look at others who had so-called miracles, where a loved one is miraculously cured of their disease and I can't help but ask why our family couldn't experience the same. What makes them so special to where they get another chance at life? Maybe one day I'll get an answer. We now live in a new house, and for the two years we've lived here, nothing strange or supernatural has ever happened and I truly hope it stays that way. Seventh Story This story was shared by you slash Suitable Ground. The Tall Hat Man I remembered something that happened to me when I was very young. And I will tell it to you. My family owns an old house at the old barrios downtown, not only that, some of the family from my mother's side is said to have been witches, read the tarot, playing the board, among other things. The house was left to us as most of the people either was dead or didn't want it. Me and my dad went to check it out, and after some weeks of it coming into our position, we decided to start preparing it to be inhabited. The house was big, but the terrain on the back was even bigger. It was full of leaves and old trees. To each side buildings that looked like rooms but were either unfinished or in decay. High ceilings. Long corridors. Rooms with two or even three doors that connected them between each other. The walls also had small nails hammered into the walls, very high in weird geometrical figures. It was far from where my family lived so dad decided we stay the nights after working on it. As there was no furniture there, also no electricity, we brought some hamacas, once for each. Hammock for you altoug not exactly. These are made of strings and don't have the weird wooden things the patio ones you know have. The first night we stayed I had a dream of walking the house alone, feeling even smaller than I already was, in the dark, only some moonlight entering through the dirty windows. After I got to the backyard pulled by some force. There I saw a shape, a dark, huge shape with two piercing red eyes and a top hat, under the moonlight. I felt its eyes smother me, I felt desperation that I could not describe for what seemed like hours and I woke up sweaty at that unfamiliar house of my ancestors. The night after it I woke up in the middle of the night, feeling my hammock being swinged. I thought it was my dad and asked him to stop, to let me sleep. As I opened my eyes, I saw my dad enter the room from the bathroom carrying a flashlight. He asked me if he had awoken me. I was perplexed. I asked not to stay any more after that. Now. I can believe I imagined all that. I was young. The stories might have got to my imagination. But as I had a conversation with my dad these last days, he reminded me of these things I had forgotten. I searched the internet for it, and it seems the tall hat man has visited many. The hat, the red eyes, the black shape. Everything I saw and felt is said by many strangers around the world. I'm afraid and I feel watched. Maybe I was better off forgetting about it. Now I only wonder if it has visited after that or if it will visit me again. I don't sleep a lot, but this might make me sleep even less. Eighth Story This story was shared by you slash LKL underscore mind. I was possessed by something from beyond this universe. Last night I received a package outside the front door of my apartment room. The sender's name was Dr. Ramirez with no return address. 
Curious, I took it inside and sat on my chair in the living room. After tearing the package open, I noticed multiple CDs and a letter. This is what the letter said. Dear Jacob, I've waited many years to deliver this evidence to you of your strange and unsettling possession back in early November to New Year's Eve of 1999. Why I have waited so long to do so will be explained to you on the last disc labeled, Number 5, Reverend Matthew's Remarks. I recommend you listen to each disc in numerical order. That way you understand things more clearly. After listening to all of the discs, you may have to urge to contact your parents but I advise against that greatly, for their own mental health sake. They need to continue to recover from what happened. I'm afraid that it will bring back terrible memories of what transpired and will open doors to some things that should never be seen again. As for Reverend Matthew, the same thing will happen. Take care. And for what has happened and might happen, I'm so sorry. Dear Ramirez. Clearly I became confused yet a bit unsettled as well. I can barely remember what happened in the winter of 1999. No matter how hard I tried, it seemed like I kept hitting a wall. I don't even remember my family or even Dr. Ramirez mentioning anything of what happened that winter. Now I wanted to know what happened, curious to see if the CDs sitting on the coffee table could help me remember. So I got up, got my old as hell Walkman with some new earbuds, sat back on the couch and put in the first CD labeled, Number 1, First Interview with the Possessing Spirit. These are my transcriptions of the CDs. Here is the transcription of CD number 1. Shuffling of what I assume is people getting seated. Sound of a middle-aged man clearing his throat. The man speaks, this is the first interview with the entity possessing Jacob Malcon. He is an 14-year-old boy, Caucasian, lives with his mother Marissa Malcon, his mother Henry Malcon and Jacob's sister Cassie Malcon in the city of Loud Static blocks out the name in Washington State. Now, we can begin. Jacob, I am Dr. Ramirez. I'm here because your parents weren't sure what to do after they noticed you were acting strange for the past three weeks. They told me you seemed possessed and believe it to be true. I want to talk to whatever is possessing you, if that's alright with you. My eleven-year-old self, it's alright. My voice sounds calm but I can sense some fear in it. Dr. Ramirez. Can you bring that entity out for me? Me, yes. Dr. Ramirez, well I'm ready when you are. Asterisk sounds of me breathing deeply for a four minutes. After four minutes pass there is a minute of silence followed by the quiet droning of a low-pitched and distorted ringing asterisk. Dr. Ramirez, Jacob, I or it speaks with my voice, but it's echoed, monotone and it sounds like it's underwater. And it sounds wrong. The entity, he is not here now. Dr. Ramirez, am I speaking to the entity possessing Jacob's body? The entity, yes. Dr. Ramirez, you said he is not here. Where is Jacob then? The entity, his spirit is where I am from. While I take control of his body, his soul is sent to my dimension. Dr. Ramirez, your dimension. Where is that? The entity, there are infinite dimensions. Yours is the third, mine is the eighth. Dr. Ramirez, Jacob's parents believe that you are demonic. Are you a demon? The entity, what I am is not a demon, not in your species' religions or spiritual perceptions. Dr. Ramirez, if you aren't a demon, then what are you then? The entity, an explorer. 
Dr. Ramirez, please be more specific. There is silence for a minute then the entity responds. The entity, there is no need to specify to you, for now. My time speaking with you is done for now. Dr. Ramirez, why? Why must you finish talking to us? The droning ringing suddenly ceases and I am heard breathing deeply and heavily. Dr. Ramirez, hello. Me, am I back? Is it done? I sound like I just woke up from a nightmare. Dr. Ramirez, Jacob. Me, Dr. Ramirez, what did it say? Dr. Ramirez, well, it didn't tell us much except for it being an explorer from another dimension. According to what it told us, it's not demonic. My mother, I don't believe that for one second. The things it's made him do are just, they're not good. They give me the chills. Whatever it is, it's evil. It needs to leave him now. Dr. Ramirez, I need to conduct more interviews with it. Besides, Reverend Matthew said it doesn't match with any demonic behavior ever recorded. My father, that doesn't eliminate the possibility though. Dr. Ramirez, Size will have this talk later. For now, you all need some rest. The recording ends there. I was confused and a bit unsettled. My voice in that interview when whatever spoke through me, sounded wrong. And not in an evil way, I'm saying that it was wrong in a weird way, just so weird that it felt wrong. Like nothing human should be able to make that voice. I took out the CD and put in the next one labeled, Number 2, Interview with Jacob's Parents. The recording began immediately with Dr. Ramirez talking to my parents. Dr. Ramirez, that's physically impossible. My father, well it happened. We both saw. Here, see for yourself. There's a single click of a button on what I assume is a TV remote. About 30 seconds of silence pass. Dr. Ramirez, what in the hell? My father, see. Dr. Ramirez, his eyes, I've never seen eyes do that before. My mother, they do that every night ever since the last night of November, at the same exact time, 11 p.m. I always go into his bedroom to make sure he's asleep. Well, he's always sitting up, facing the door, with those eyes glowing with that sickly purple. I jump of course, but I don't feel like they're looking at me. Dr. Ramirez, what do you mean? Like he's looking beyond you? My mother, well, yes. But not behind me in the other room or even at the house next to ours. It's like he's looking somewhere far away. I can't describe it. Dr. Ramirez, his pupils seem to be in an odd shape. I've never seen anything like that. My mother, looks like an octagon. His irises are purple with that strange glow, different from his sea green eyes of course but the white of his eyes are gone. It's just black. A terrible black like those pupils. Dr. Ramirez, is this the first recording of this type of phenomenon? My mother, yes. At first I just thought it was my mind playing tricks on me due to stress of the other things he's done before and the awful nightmares I've been having. Dr. Ramirez, nightmares, my mother, takes a deep breath I've been getting them ever since that thing starting controlling him. They're like your usual odd dream, but there's this constant feeling of being watched by something so vast, so big, bigger than the sun, like it was the sun itself, like an eye in space. But I couldn't see it. Before I would wake up from the nightmare, 
that feeling become so overwhelming that I could scream out of pure horror. I could almost see that I, see its exact form, its foul horrifying details. I end up waking up Henry with this disturbing scream, like I'm groaning and screaming at the same time. I, I wake up horrified but the horror quickly subsides when I realize I'm back here, when I'm awake again. Makes me scared sometimes to fall back asleep. I've ended up taking anti-anxiety medication and sleeping aids to help me calm down enough to fall asleep. Dr. Ramirez, what time does this happen, exactly? My mother, it happens at 4 in the morning, that's when I wake up. Dr. Ramirez, I'm sorry you've been going through that. What about you, Mr. Malcon? My father, luckily I haven't had it as bad as her, when it comes to sleep. But I do feel that same feeling of being watched whenever I'm outside any building, especially the house. It's not intense, it's kinda subtle. Makes my walks that I go on feel a bit eerie. Especially at night. Dr. Ramirez, there's not much sound that I can hear except for what seems like a ringing sound the whole time. Did you check the tape? My father, I checked it multiple times. Nothing's wrong, not that I can tell. Dr. Ramirez, well, if it's okay, I'd like to have a copy of this tape so I can share it with an ophthalmologist I know of. And I'd like to show Reverend Matthew the tape as well to get his opinion. My father, alright. As long it helps. Dr. Ramirez, I can't promise anything but it's better than doing nothing. We'll conduct another interview with the supposed entity in about a week. Does December 11th work for you too? Both my mother and father, yes. Dr. Ramirez, okay. Well I'll let you both know if I find anything, as soon as I can. Recording ends there. Okay, now I was creeped out. Why were my eyes the way my mother described? How could they be like that? What made me feel quite uneasy as well was that my mother had nightmares of being watched by some type of freaky eye and my father felt like he was being watched too but in the real world, watched by something he couldn't see. I wasn't planning on sleeping that night anyways, so I decided to put the next CD in. It was labeled, Number 3, Second Interview with the Possessing Entity. The recording begins. Dr. Ramirez, this is the second interview with the entity possessing Jacob. His mother and father are joining us tonight at 8 p.m. on December 11th. Now we can. The entity already cuts Dr. Ramirez off, begin. Dr. Ramirez, I see you came earlier than expected. I thought Jacob needed to do his usual little ritual to have you come through. The entity, I can take over whenever I need to. That ritual, form of meditation, is only needed when it is needed. Dr. Ramirez, but usually when a spirit comes through, it takes time, it takes a process. The entity, that process is limited only to the spirits you know of. It is not limited to entities such as myself. Dr. Ramirez, are you saying there are others like you? The entity, there are many others. There are many without number. Dr. Ramirez, are they explorers like you? The entity, some are. Others are not. We have different yet similar purposes. Dr. Ramirez, how? The entity, say one's purpose is a creator. Its ultimate purpose is similar to one that's purpose is a destroyer. Dr. Ramirez, do you have genders? The entity, we are not bound by such a thing. Dr. Ramirez, do you procreate? The entity, 
there is no need of reproducing. Dr. Ramirez, when did your species come to existence? The entity, we know not and we care not to know when. What we know of our existence is that we simply came into existence where time is non-existent. Dr. Ramirez, but every species, even demons and angels us humans believe and know of, have a beginning. Created by God. The entity, we have no beginning. We have no end. The spirits you label as demons and angels have a beginning and can have an end. We are eternal. Dr. Ramirez, you're telling me demons and angels can die. But they're immortal. The entity, immortal in a sense to you. Mortal in the infinite scope of everything. They are the peak of fourth dimensional entities and lower fifth entities. We are eight dimensional beings. Bound not by time and space. Dr. Ramirez, if you're eight dimensional beings, you surely know the past, present and future of this dimension. The entity, that is correct. Dr. Ramirez, then why even bother possessing Jacob, talking to us, doing what you do that affects his parents and sister? The entity, my purpose is unimaginable to you. All you can comprehend is an extremely thin simplification of what I do. And I let you comprehend such a thing because I allow it. Dr. Ramirez, you're an explorer, you say. Do you tell others of what you do? The entity, I report to those who have different purposes, to serve our ultimate objective. Dr. Ramirez, can you describe at all to us what those others' purposes are? What is the ultimate objective your species has? The entity, those whose purposes names you can comprehend are creators and destroyers. The others have no labels that are unknown to your species. Dr. Ramirez, the nightmares Jacob's mother has, is that from you? The entity, it is. I watch her in her dreams as I watch her partner in your kind's waking reality. Dr. Ramirez, is what Mrs. Malcon sees at the end of her nightmares, is that you? The entity, it is a vague comprehensible glimpse of a part of me. Dr. Ramirez, do you have a form that you can describe to us? The entity, not one you can fathom. The eye the mother of the mother sees is what I allow her mind to grasp without shattering her mind into oblivion. Dr. Ramirez, but why? Why do you watch her? Why do you watch Mr. Malcon? The entity, it is part of what you'd call predetermined exploration. It is because I need to do so. Dr. Ramirez, what do you explore? The entity, memories, emotions, aspirations and destinations. Dr. Ramirez, you're telling me you know what will happen to them. The entity, every detail. This conversation is done. We will speak again. My eleven-year-old self suddenly gasps as if waking from a nightmare, just like before. Dr. Ramirez, Jacob, Jacob are you back with us? Me, doctor. Oh my god. Doctor I don't want to go back. I'm breathing heavily and I sound horrified. Dr. Ramirez, what do you mean? What happened, Jacob? Me, they did things to me. They did terrible things. They, I start dry heaving and end up vomiting. My mother, sweetie. I can hear he get up from where she's sitting and walks up to me to comfort me honey, get a towel and a bowl. I hear what I'm assuming is my dad getting up and leaving the room. Dr. Ramirez, what kind of things? My mother, doctor. Leave him be, at least for now, please. Dr. Ramirez, alright. 
But I'd like to ask him about it later after he gets some rest. He sighs Dan. Illil call you tomorrow and see if he's ready to talk, okay? My mother, okay, doctor. The recording ends there. My blood was cold when that CD finished. If I had alcohol on me I would have down a few shots of vodka just to ease the strong dread that was flowing inside me. But I hadn't touched liquor for almost two years and I actually felt afraid to even go outside to get some. So I stayed on my chair and took that third CD out and put in the fourth one which was labeled, number four, final interview with the possessing entity. The recording begins. Two minutes of nothing but silence passes until Dr. Ramirez nervously clears his throat. Dr. Ramirez, why did you do it? Asterisk the entity speaks in a new voice. Yet there is another voice layered on top of the one it used before. This new voice has that same underwater quality like the other but it is inhumanly deep, guttural, cold yet discernible, asterisk. The entity, it was their time to see my eyes in this reality. Dr. Ramirez, you drove them insane. Dr. Ramirez sounded both angry and scared. The entity, that is their natural reaction to seeing my eyes less filtered in this reality. They asked me to reveal myself before them and who they call Reverend Matthew. Dr. Ramirez, but why is he still able to speak? The entity, because I allow it. It was destined. He must be capable enough to tell Jacob's older self about me. The clearer picture. Dr. Ramirez, why his older self? Why not have him tell Jacob now? The entity, his mind is not strong enough to comprehend such things at this time. When he reaches the age of 33 he will then be ready to know what he is destined to know. Dr. Ramirez, why not have me tell him? The entity, you were not destined to. Your purpose was to converse with me and record it. And you have fulfilled that. Silence for three minutes passes until I can hear Dr. Ramirez speak again. Dr. Ramirez, we had no choice, didn't we? I can hear the anger absent from Dr. Ramirez with fearful despair replacing it. The entity, no, you did not. You never had the free will you deluded yourself to have. Free will is non-existent in all things, your species especially. Your trivial ability to observe the universe, what you call self-awareness, has caused you to believe the lie that you are free. Dr. Ramirez, what about you and your kind? I'm guessing you have a choice unlike us. The entity, we have free will and no free will. Choice for us is an incomprehensible paradox that is not translatable and communicable to your species that would not tear your minds into nothingness. Dr. Ramirez, at least tell me or show me at least a glimpse of what your plan is. Tell me, please. The entity, you are not destined to. Reverend Matthew was destined. If you ask him, his ability to speak will be silenced. Dr. Ramirez, you're you're an abomination. The entity, call me what you wish, but it will change nothing. Our conversing with each other is finished. The recording ends immediately after those final words. I couldn't believe what I just heard. I've known Dr. Ramirez for years as my psychologist until he went missing three years ago and now he sent me this package with these CDs and the letter. Did that entity really control what he was supposed to do? My parents never mentioned any of this to me after they were released from the psychiatric hospital back in 2015. Before they were released I wasn't even able to visit them. I guess it makes sense 
that something traumatic caused them to take that long to mentally recover. I was going to ask Reverend Matthew about it, but that temptation was silenced after I listened to the final CD. I took out the fourth CD and put in the fifth one. Then I pressed play with the dread now near overwhelming. The final CD, number five, Reverend Matthew's remarks began. Recording begins. Reverend Matthew's raspy old voice speaks to the recorder, I, I have witnessed things no human should witness. I have experienced things that petrify the mind and soul. Things that make me question my own faith, all faith in fact. He takes a deep sigh and continues. Reverend Matthew, midnight, on the 29th of December, three nights ago, after getting permission from the church, Marissa and Henry Malcon and I demanded the entity possessing Jacob to reveal itself. All three of us were angry and tired of the constant fear and horror it imposed on us along with Cassie, who was thankfully not present during the interviews Dr. Ramirez conducted with the entity. She, however, unbeknownst to us all before she told me herself, were having similar nightmares as her mother. Understandably she didn't wish to stress her parents and Jacob even more as they were. Luckily she was at a friend's house on the midnight of the 29th. I guess it was for the best, especially with what happened. I had everything with me, the Holy Bible, my cross, holy water and even the Quran and the Tanakh. I read every verse that demanded the entity to reveal itself and its name. I regret ever doing so. I'm so sorry, Henry and Marissa. I'm sorry for what happened. Even though I know now that it was all predetermined, I still feel guilt. After I demanded the entity to reveal itself, a low-pitched ringing filled the living room where this took place. The lights burnt out and a thick atmosphere of dread filled the air with a strange coldness I've never felt before. Jacob's eyes glowed in the darkness of the room, that was all we could see. And then that seemingly endless darkness we were trapped in was filled with countless familiar and unknown galaxies of this universe. The unknown galaxies gave off a powerful ominous aura and moved with slow demented motions. The eyes that belonged to Jacob, but glowed from the entity's presence, then gradually transformed into eyes that the memory of makes my blood go cold and terror consume my soul as it does now. Those eyes, those eyes. No God, no sane God would ever allow such things to exist. The pupils were of that familiar octagon shape, yet they took form in multiple shapes so swiftly that it hurts my head trying to remember it. Shapes that I recognized and that were non-Euclidean. And the irises of those soul-piercing abominable eyes remained that purple color, but appeared to be made up of thick depths of layered galaxies and nebulae that let out horrific screams of billions of souls contorted and reverberating. What I saw next, what it showed me is beyond words. The least I can tell you, Jacob, is that it was traumatic enough to put me on multiple medications and therapy sessions every week to keep me from falling into a bottomless abyss of maddening terror that I'd never return from. What I will say is this, that entity is waiting for you, Jacob. It's waiting for the destined time of when your future actions in this life will bring forth. Something nightmarish beyond all our imaginings will happen and there's nothing anyone or anything can do to stop it. That explorer will show you more than it has shown me in the near future. And when it does, all those who exist and ever existed, both living and dead, angels and demons, will be inevitably swallowed into the ultimate nightmare that has no end. I was predestined to record this and tell you these things, Jacob. 
I had no choice just like how Dr. Ramirez had no choice to not destroy the recordings and how he had to wait to send you the package you will receive on the night of the 28th of November in 2021. God help, no. The God I believed in doesn't exist, not that kind. Whatever God exists is something I don't wish to even think of for a second. May heaven have mercy on you, on all of us, what am I even saying? Damn it! I can't take this. I'm sorry, Jacob. I'm sorry. And there the final recording ends. After the final CD was done, I slowly took out my earbuds and let them fall to the floor. All I could do was sit back on my chair and let everything soak in. The dread I felt had now mutated into something unfamiliar and vile, which had swallowed my entire mind and body. I still feel it now. For three hours I've been getting flashes of this petrifying eye, flashing through my mind. These images and scenes are so vividly nightmarish that they make me want to dry heave. I wish I could dry heave or vomit to get some relief, but I can't. I don't even have the urge to call Reverend Matthew or even try to find out a way to contact Dr. Ramirez. If I'm able to, I'm going to visit my parents and tell them I love them and spend some time with them. I won't mention anything, not one bit of what I've just learned and heard. They don't need to relive those living nightmares. They don't need to remember. As for myself, I'm terrified of what's going to happen and of what's even happening right now. There's this new awareness that shouldn't be experienced. May my sanity be spared. I don't know if I'll ever be able to be normal. I don't know how long my mind can take this before it becomes something that I don't want to imagine. My mind's becoming a door, a window to something awful, and the veil is becoming thinner with each passing minute. I'm scared. So scared. What is happening? What the is going on? What the hell is happening? Ninth story. This story was shared by you slash somebody's underscore buddy. I think the little girl I used to babysit was possessed. Every person's name has been changed in this story. When I graduated high school, I went to college for only a year. I didn't finish because of personal reasons. I needed a way to make some money, and finding a job in my little town wasn't easy. My mom suggested to me that Mr. Frederick was in need of a sitter basically nanny because he worked out of town and was away for sometimes weeks. The kids would stay with their grandmother on occasion but she was getting up there in age and it was difficult to manage two young children. That next weekend I called and asked if he was still looking for a nanny, and quickly he replied, yes, we discussed what I would be paid and so forth. I was to start the following weekend, and would have to watch them every other week. Matthew was 13. Julie was 8. Their mother died giving birth to Julie. But with that being said, they were still very good kids, very well behaved. I arrived on time, Mr. Frederick was putting his luggage in his trunk when I pulled up. He greeted me with a smile. Gave me a list of numbers if I needed him, told me he thought Julie was coming down with a cold, not to let her outside for a few days, just to be safe. He went in to kiss the kids goodbye and was on his way. The first night, the kids went to bed after playing a few board games with me and watching a movie. Julie seemed better, until she woke up at about midnight throwing up, violently throwing up. I rubbed her back and put a cold wash cloth on her neck. I was about to call her dad afraid she might have something more than a cold like the flu. But she said she felt much better afterwards, and just wanted to go to bed. 
I was sleeping in the guest room. When I was woken up by laughter. I open my eyes and Julie is sitting on the foot of my bed, Indian style, back facing me. She was still laughing when I sat up. I laughed a little with her, then asked what are you laughing at sweetie? Almost immediately after I asked her that she stopped laughing. And almost sounded like she was growling. I said her name softly, kinda just confused what she was doing. She starts screaming stop laughing at me over and over. I get out of bed immediately, grab onto her shoulders and start yelling her name Julie, Julie. She then looks at me, grinding her teeth and says through her teeth. I slit Matthew's throat and then her laughing started again. I ran to Matthew's room, bust through the door and find him sleeping peacefully. I was afraid to go back downstairs. I told myself, don't be afraid of a little girl. A little girl I've seen grow up. I make my way down the steps when Julie is standing at the bottom. I'm tired, can I go to bed now, she asked me, rubbing her eyes. I just looked at her and simply said, yeah. Maybe she was dreaming, because of the Tylenol I gave her, it made her sleepwalk. I brushed it off. The next morning both kids were sleepy, we ate breakfast. I took them to the park. We had a fun busy day. Bedtime, I couldn't help but feel fear. That shit she said to me through her teeth about her brother, just wasn't right. I sent them to bed, I noticed when Julie was running up the steps she smiled at me I smiled back, then she turned around a second time and smiled at me again and it freaked me the fuck out. It wasn't her smile, her cheerful little sweet girl smile. It was like she changed within seconds, I know it was just a smile, but it made my heart drop. 1 AM. I'm texting my friend Liz, just talking about the day and bullshitting. When I hear what almost sounds like chanting. I put my phone down and make my way towards the sound. At the top of the flight of steps, Julie is standing there, feet basically off the first step, seriously her heels of her feet were the only thing on the step. I kinda yelled at her. Julie. Get off the step like that you're going to fall. She kept saying something, it sounded like nonsense. And then she started saying it slower, while she was looking at me. I'm not the most religious person but I know the Lord's Prayer, and she was saying this backwards. It freaked me out. I just stood there mouth open, eyes not blinking, throat dry listening to this eight-year-old saying this prayer backwards. Julie. I yelled it. She stopped, looked at me, smiles and said good night. I heard her door close and I locked my door and passed out. The next day Matthew gets up early, looking awful. Are you getting sick? I asked putting my hand on his head. He grabbed my hand and looked me in the eyes and said, Julie scares me, it sent chills through my body. I asked, why? He immediately answered, she watches me sleep, but I'm not sleeping, she laughs, and says things I don't understand. I asked him, what kinds of things? And he said he couldn't understand her it sounded like she was just, and he did this thing with his tongue. To me it sounded like he was trying to say she was speaking in tongues. Julie walked in the kitchen. Our conversation was ended, and Matthew got up from the table with his cereal bowl. She grabbed his arm and while looking at me, said. Don't trust the whore. I screamed at her. H-E-Y, don't you talk like that again. She smiled at me, and in her cheerful little voice, asked, can I have some lucky charms? I called my mom, 
who said she simply is acting out because her dad is away, and she wanted attention. I told her I was getting freaked. And she just went on to give me just lecture on how Mr. Frederick was counting on me. The last night I was there, same routine. Movies and bedtime. I got a hug from Matthew and Julie followed I felt bad for not wanting to hug her. She squeezed me hard and kisses me cheek. Then she whispered in my ear really slowly, I wouldn't sleep tonight, this voice was much deeper more manly than a little girl's voice. I cried, it completely terrified me. I'm worried a fucking demon child is going to kill me in my sleep. I didn't sleep at all. I stared blankly at the TV infomercials. That's when I heard screaming, horrible, makes your heart drop screaming. I flew out of the room and ran up the steps. I checked Matthew first he was closest. He was just staring at me when I opened the door, he then ran with me Aro July's room. I opened her door, when she was right there right in front of me, but her head was bent so far back it was touching her back, you could hear clicking from her bones. I feel bad now for doing this, but I slammed the door, called 911. Followed by calling her dad, being hysterical telling him about everything that had happened. Julie was taken to a mental hospital, evaluated, and let go. They said she suffered a slight brain aneurysm and a seizure. I never babysat for the Fredericks after that. But I did get a letter in the mail from all three of them. Mr. Fredericks, kind words thanking me for watching the children, Matthew, basically the same thing. And July's, it said exactly this. You can sleep again, and she drew a black cross and black clouds. Tenth story. Recurring dreams about possession. Hey guys. I see a lot of great posts here and I'm not sure if they're real or not. They're referred to as stories, and this isn't exactly a story as such. It's something that's been happening for a while. And I'm not entirely sure if I can post real life events. But I'm very confused and I would highly appreciate help in any form or way. Open to all sorts of theories just need to figure out what's going on. For the past few years, I've had these recurring dreams where I keep getting possessed. Now, there's nothing weird about that. A dream is a dream. But it's how real the dream feels. It's like I'm actually experiencing it while I'm asleep. Does that make sense? Let me describe one instance. The dream took place in the lounge of my house, like most of the other dreams where I'm possessed do. I'm conversing with someone about something that's in the house, when suddenly, I'm swept up and dragged around mercilessly. I'm screaming in the dream, but I can hear another scream from within myself. And both these screams are crystal clear to me when I'm asleep. I'm also constantly yelling at myself to wake up. I'm scared in the dream, and sometimes, I'm aware that I'm half awake, and I feel my body tensing up. Now, I'm a Muslim, and we have a small recitation to ward off evil. It's called the Ayatul Kursi and it's recited for protection. We essentially ask Allah for help and it's just something that works if you have faith in it. I do. I know a lot of people here don't believe in religion, that's totally cool, but bear with me for a bit, please. In my dream, each time, I start reciting that and it's immensely hard to say it because something is holding me back. However, every time I recite it, I wake up reading the Ayatul Kursi out loud, my body shaking vigorously. Sometimes, I wake up and I'm in a state of sleep paralysis, the Ayatul Kursi still being recited in my mind. 
It's been happening for a while, but I'm posting about it now because yesterday, I had the dream again. However, the location was different. I was in some abandoned farmhouse. And I was being flinged around that farmhouse like a rag doll. However, upon recitation, I woke up once more, shaking and terrified. Now, I know you can only dream of places slash people you've seen before. But I can assure you I have never, ever seen that farmhouse in my life. There was just something new, something strange about it. And I have no idea how I ended up there. I'm not sure what's happening. Maybe it's just a dream and nothing more. But it's crazy how aware I am of my own sleeping body when I'm dreaming. Often, when I'm possessed, I will yell at myself to wake up, or tell myself it's a dream. A friend suggested that I was lucid dreaming, but I don't know how to and I've never actively tried to lucid dream. If anyone has any idea about what's happening, please let me know. I'm willing to look into any theory slash explanation. Thank you. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinion slash suggestions in the comment section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.